Okay, so with that proviso, well, I'll, I'll offer some comments. And I, I, I wanna talk here about three of the approaches. This is my name, X agent based and discrete event. We've actually done quite a bit of social network analysis, um, a lot over the years. I don't view that as most commonly practiced as a dynamic model. It is a complex systems method, but it's not in its, in its most basic form. It's often more characterized in structure than dynamic behavior. But there are exceptions, and there are cases where social network analysis and agent based modeling are very, uh, very close. Um, so I want to talk about each of these others very briefly. And this is not going to be any, you know, sizable sort of in-depth discussion. I just want to give you a flavor of them so that I can talk some about the trade-off um, and, and talk about hybrids. But I need you to be able to, um, you know, read diagrams. And I'm, I'm going to be able to, I'm going to talk about these each in a sympathetic way. I like my kids and I, I, I love each. Um, so system dynamics uh, is a modeling method. Some years ago, um, there was actually a vote taken at the International System Dynamics Conference on whether it was a field. And the room was amazingly split um, in, in very pronounced way. Is, is it a research field? Um, I like to refer to it as a, as a perspective and methodology, and much more so than compartmental modeling in its, in its, uh, in its sort of um, in its perspective, it, it has a very specific kind of almost philosophical perspective um, that's broader. It's actually uh, not merely a matter of analytics. It's, it's a broader perspective on, on feedback and accumulation within. It's a broad evolving methodology to conceptualize, describe, analyze, and manage feedback systems. And it really focuses on feedback and, and accumulation as a point of focus. And, you know, system dynamics uh, has for decades really emphasized the role that mental models play. How each of us is making decisions based on, on decisions uh, in public health are no exception, based on mental health decisions in health care. And, you know, the observation here is that, that very frequently, the reason that decision-making, um, the decisions made run into challenges and encounter problems in realizing their goals is due to, to narrow mental models and a failure to, to think um, holistically about, about the problem. And it seeks to really foster a broader understanding of the underlying system. This is really important because and from a system dynamics perspective, the perspective of many system dynamics projects, it's not the model that is the predominant purveyor of value. It's the mental models that get improved by modeling that come out of it. And this has made a really big impact on me, you know, um, uh, over the years. And I carry that philosophy through to, to agent-based models. Um, so some features of, of system dynamics, you know, feedbacks, are recognized as the fundamental shapers of behavior and the identified feedback from systems. And accumulations are recognized as, you know, for example, never a smoker, current smoker, or former smoker as, as um, really have playing very big roles in inertia and delay of the system, et cetera. And, and there's a very rich sort of perspective in, in analytics that people will take in, in understanding systems we can get a lot of insights by enumerating, enumerating the feedbacks and distinguishing accumulation from, say, flows that, that affect. And within this, there's a real interest in how do our cognitive limits limit our ability to reason about these systems? This turns out to be really important in terms of the models that come out of this, um, many system dynamics projects. Um, stakeholder participation, because mental models are so important, stakeholders are seen as absolutely critical for you know, involvement of stakeholders is critical to shift their mental model, for example, to inform them, to give them a sense of ownership and a sense of buy-in and a sense of understanding of model results. You're not just providing results from the model and saying, this is the analytics, this is what it's telling you to do, go off and, and implement it. You're, you're trying to shift people's thinking. Um, and the models here are really 
amenable to sort of formal analysis and reasoning, as well as sort of more informal. Um, there's a set of, of, of diagrammatic, diagrammatic techniques that have come out of this that um, uh, span from sort of uh, qualitative or semi-qualitative, like what are called positive diagrams here, shown with feedbacks indicated and with polarities, um, through to what are called system structure diagrams, where we take this and we'll, we'll distinguish what's the stock and what's the flow, these, what's an accumulation, what's or an instantaneous sort of change on that accumulation, rate of change of that accumulation. Um, and then full-blown sort of stock and flow models, which are common, um, common components. Um, so, um, you know, some notable strengths of system dynamics is it's, it's an amazingly effective methodology for capturing, um, for characterizing change in continuous variables over time. Um, and uh, if we think about like an SEIRS model here, we have these stocks, those are the, the these, um, rectangles, they're also called levels. In other areas, cognate to this, uh, such as compartmental models, they'll be called compartments or sometimes state variables for those for more mathematical backgrounds. Here you'll notice that there's four of them to characterize divisions of a population, but there might be others which are not population segments, um, but which are things like the number of total number of infections that have occurred to this point. That's not a count of people. It's the count of infections that have occurred to this point. Or maybe there'd be accumulated costs or quality adjusted life years lived in the population thus far. So system dynamics uses these stock and flow diagrams as one of its firmware's tools. There's causal loop diagrams. Uh, often those get formulated with system structure diagrams. Um, which kind of look a bit like this, but don't have the, the, the rules for flows. And then there's a then there's a, a full formulation and a stock and flow diagram. These are stocks. They represent these accumulations. So at any one time, there's a certain number of people that are susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered. Um, it's this cross-sectional depiction of the population if they play space. Um, if you froze the system at any one time, you could count the number of people on the stocks. By contrast, flows, um, flows here are represent sort of the, 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 the processes of change that affect the values of the stocks. So there's a flow representing change from people who were infected going on to be recovered. This is the recovery process. A certain number of people per day are going from infected to recovery. A certain number of people are leaving the latent state of infection. We call the exposed population becoming infected. That's a, and those are rates of change. Those are certain number per day coming in to infective to completing latency. A certain number going out to recovery, and and collectively those are going to end up increasing infectives over time or decreasing. So completing latency, if you have 10 people coming in because they're getting up to the latent state of infection and becoming infected, then you have five people leaving. So 10 people coming in per day, five people leaving per day. How quickly do you think infectives will be rising on a per day basis? 10 people per day coming in, five people per day leaving. Infectives will be going up by five per day. That's right. Kind of like water is coming into your bathtub at Oh, God, now I'm in a pickle. I'm tempted to say two liters per minute, um, but for our U.S. guests, I guess I'll say two gallons per minute, um, or, or you know, a quarter gallon per minute, or what have you. Um, say two gallons uh, per minute, and it's leaving at one gallon per minute. It's going to be rising at at one gallon of water each successive minute. Um, it's, be rising. Um, it's coming in faster than it's leaving. Um, similarly, if the, outflow, if the outflow is greater than the inflow, it'll be going down. And it's amazing. System dynamics, you can look at a diagram, you can look at observed data from the world, and you can reason about inflows and outflows. And it will tell you an awful lot about what's going on in the system by, um, 
by reasoning about, okay, like the number of infected people is staying constant. Well, you know, this inflow equals that outflow, for example. Um, and you're constantly referring back and forth to these diagrams to sort of understand phenomena for the world in this sort of stock and flow fashion. So here, stocks, the values of flows are determined by stocks. If there's no one to leave the infected state, um, if there's no one infected, you're not going to have any recovery. So generally, the flows will depend on the stock. If there are a million people infected, you're going to get quite a few out per day. So the flows in general will depend on stock. Sometimes they just depend on the one that whence they come, the one from which they're leaving. Sometimes they depend on several, like infection requires two to tango, right? Susceptibles and infections to, to create a new a case of new infection. But in general, flows determine depend on stocks. If there's no susceptibles in the population, there's going to be no new infections. If there's no infectives in the population, there's going to be no, no infections. That's a, a, a nonlinear. On the other hand, flows determine change in stocks over time. So, you know, the, how infective changes, how quickly it rises depends on the flows in and the flows out of it. The net flow will determine how how quickly it rises. I'm giving you this bit of background because we're going to be seeing the stock and flow models a lot this morning. Okay. And you'll probably be seeing them episodically uh, through the day. So, um, system dynamics modeling um, is this feedback and accumulation centric modeling approach, often focused on changing mental models or focuses uh, uh, on changing how people think about a system. And it spans, therefore, qualitative and quantitative methods. Um, it has this, this hierarchy of diagrams where often you elaborate one into the next in this really um, insightful fashion. Um, some of our other work are, is using some, some mathematics to, to really rigor, make rigorous that sort of hierarchy of diagrams. But we won't be talking about that in this week. Um, uh, it supports very rich mathematical analyses. So a lot of our machine learning analyses that we use to inform decision making and that have been used by every province in Canada, uh, both for First Nations research and for general population for COVID-19 decision making, those have been based on stock and flow models coupled with machine learning. And it's because they're mathematically tractable and, and analyzable. And they're fast. Um, and you can have interactive model running. System dynamics models are very lightweight to simulate for their basic smaller models. They can get large if you start to represent heterogeneity in large amounts. And really, you're better suited going to an agent based model. So that's system dynamics, uh, a wonderful approach uh, with so much to recommend it. And it's the modeling their process as much as the models that offer really a great deal of insight. Let's go on and talk about discrete event simulation. So discrete event simulation. Yes, question. A question. Ah, yes, Michael. Sorry. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Agent-based modeling is awesome at capturing feedback mechanisms. Um, Agent-based modeling can capture feedbacks that cannot be well expressed in system dynamics. But, but system dynamics make system dynamics methods make the make feedbacks evident. They they make them visually obvious. Um, I, I'm not showing it here if this were a system structure. Uh, this, is, this If this were a system structure diagram, I'd actually have uh, these, um, these links labeled, for example, between exposed population and completing latency, there'd be a plus link. There'd be an implicit negative link from completing latency back to exposed because as this rises, completing latency rises, exposed is drawn down compared to the value it otherwise would have had all of the things being equal. Um, if only my students remembered that from, from class. Um, I'm talking about, not grad students, I'm talking with students in my undergrad modeling class. Um, but 
there's, there's feedbacks here, and they are obvious visually when you look at one of these diagrams. And there is a tradition of paying attention to them and, and um, using them to some degree in analysis, certainly at the level of causal loop diagrams, but also in some quantitative analysis methods. So I'll actually say like, at this time, which feedback loops are driving system behavior? So, you know, if we have an outbreak early on, it's the infection loop. It's kind of this loop here that's dominating. Uh, later on, it starts to become limits to infection caused by, you know, depletion of susceptibles. So you could argue there's a different loop. And then later, it's the recovery loop that's dominant. And so there are these methods that will sort of sketch out over time which of these loops are dominant. So feedback loops form this this sort of, they're given explicit attention. They're given um, almost a privileged status, a sort of special focus, and for good reason. Um, in my undergrad class, I'd like to illustrate the importance of feedback for behavior by balancing a broom handle on my finger and showing that you know with feedback, I can keep it balanced for minutes at a time. Um, but if I close my eyes, it's going to beam me in my head. It's going to fall on me because I, I can't do jack, right? I, I'm, not getting that, I'm not getting that visual feedback. And so feedback makes systems stable, but it also leads to systems diverging when it's reinforcing feedback. And there's all these insights you get from it. But in agent-based modeling, it turns out that we can do a much better job representing certain feedbacks. I'll give you an example. Oh, um, give you an example of this. So in, in agent-based modeling, we can often explicate the causal pathways um, in, in greater, in greater, with greater clarity than we can with an aggregate model. Um, uh, within within a, a model of, let's say, smoking behavior. We had that model yesterday for, for smoking, right? Um, uh, there might be a distinction made um, you know, scientifically between factors that might th think about a youth and their propensity to start smoking. There might be some factors which are caused by their direct social network connections, like um, some of their friends are smokers, right? And they undergo peer pressure by, by the friends being smokers. We could easily represent that. Um, alternatively, you could distinguish that from mass media based depiction of, of smoking in a way that would influence the, the teens or adolescents you know, um, behavior um, and distinguish that in turn from some sort of easy availability of cigarettes in retail outlets or something like that. Within an aggregate diagram, a lot of those get mapped onto the same basic structure of kind of the more smokers, you know, the, the more smokers there are, the higher the risk that a given not, never smoker will, will initiate smoking. They all get kind of mapped down into this kind of high level depiction of current, more current smokers there are, the more, the more initiation goes on. Um, and, and that's just one fairly arbitrary example. I mean, you could, you could enumerate many others where really agent-based modeling allows you to have a quite fine-grained depiction of this. And, um, and there are some times where you can be fooled by feedbacks in a high-level diagram by thinking that they're operating at an individual level. And in fact, they are not. They're operating at, a, at, at some other level. Whereas in an agent-based model, we can make clear what level they're operating at and what the, the particular pathways are. And that makes a big difference for looking at interventions, for example, you know, whether you should regulate retail outlets for tobacco availability for teens or whether you should put your emphasis on online uh, you know, promotion or coupon availability from, from companies or whether you should put your emphasis into peer you know, resilience training for, for youth and, and uh, ability to, to sort of say no to, um, to substance use. These are, these are things which really can matter for public health decision-making. And in, in agent-based modeling, we can represent it, but 
but where are the feedbacks? A stakeholder could look at a system dynamics model and see feedbacks if you're artful about diagramming it. They can't look typically at even a, an agent-based model built in a visual way like this one over here. They, they're, they're not going to generally be able to see where the feedbacks are. And so we, using these diagrams, will sometimes add in. This hasn't been something, Wade may have seen this before. Certainly, it's part of my, my sort of modus operandi. I sometimes like to add in explicit indications that there's an influence or feedback, just to make it clear visually where certain feedbacks are. Larissa, did you have a comment or question? Yeah. Um, yeah, I am. If time permits, it'd be interesting to see how that can be done systematically. Yeah. Um, yeah. So actually, um, uh, I wish I could say that I'm responsible for that technique, but we are building on it right now in some tools, including a tool by a member of our group, uh, Xiao Yan Li. Um, uh, but, um, uh, but the truth is there, there's some published literature in the system dynamics area from some time ago on loop gain analyses. And, um, uh, and that, that is sort of cognate to another literature that Sarah will be familiar with in eigenvalue elasticity and so on. And some of the work on loop gain analyses was used in kind of the aughts, it was sometime in the aughts between 2000 and 2005. I think I may have seen it in 2004 at the Oxford Conference for System Dynamics Society. Um, sort of this uh, this live analytics, it may have been in 2007 though, now that I'm thinking about it, one of the two, where, where basically um, uh, they, had, um, they had sort of diagrammed out visually when certain feedbacks are, are um, dominant uh, within the diagram. And we're working on a tool to sort of update that to the modern era um, with, uh, with system dynamics modeling tools. Um, so we're, we're building, in fact, Eric back there, is responsible for a, um, in, together with Xiao Yan and, and Long, for uh, building up what is to be a revolutionary system dynamics modeling tool, which will allow these sort of analyses to be one of many um, easily conducted. And it's a Google Docs-like system dynamics modeling package, so many people can use it simultaneously, just as they could collaborate around Google document, they can collaborate around this one, and that will be one of many types of analyses supported. Hope that's helpful, Sarah. Glad to dialogue about it more. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, we could, if you're interested, we could demo that that system. Coming along nicely, thanks to Eric's incredibly hard work on it. So yeah, um, feedbacks, it's interesting. I, I will tell you this, this is an important part. This is actually really important. When I, when I do agent-based modeling, a lot of the time I actually think with my system dynamics hat on, because I'm actually looking at outputs for the model, which are, are of individuals, but I'm looking at summaries that are like the count of former smokers, the count of people with heart disease, right? The count of current smokers, the fraction of the population that are current smokers. These are things directly mappable to sort of stocks. So the boxes we saw, not five minutes then um, in, in system dynamics. They're not depicted this way, but they constitute stocks conceptually, like the number of people who are current smokers. It's just, it's aggregated up from lots and lots of detail, but you can still make use of the same type of thinking. What are the inflows to the stock? What are the outflows? They are captured at a far finer grained level. They are captured at this sort of level but they are there. They are simply the results of aggregating up from an individual population, just like they are, I might note, in the world. Um, and I find it extraordinarily helpful when I look at public health data or when I look at data from an agent-based model to think in stock and flow terms. Oh, the stock of people who are current smokers is going up. What does that tell us about the relative rates of cessation versus initiation? It's telling us more people are initiating per, pick your time unit, month, than are 
than our Twitter per month. Um, I'm sorry, it's actually more initiating plus former plus relapsing than our than our um, uh, than our uh, coming in, than our leaving via cessation. Similarly, if you have never smokers and there's births um, into them, uh, as well as people leaving, if the number of never smokers is going up, it means more people are coming into the population as never smokers than are leaving due to initiation. So you can reason about outcomes from agent-based models as you would reason about outcomes from a stock and flow model using, using feedbacks, using, using stocks and flows, using inflow and outflow reasoning. And it's exceptionally helpful. I find it very, very insightful. And you know, the truth is, um, I'm kind of a party pooper um, in this regard. I, I, I actually don't think system dynamics is properly as helpful to define it, to limit it to, eight, to stock and flow models. I think they're wonderfully instructive stock and flow models, but, but personally, I think there's could be a larger vision of system dynamics perspective and system dynamics methodology that embraces agent-based models as yet another way to capture these. And it's simply a matter of perspective. You're approaching it with the perspective of feedbacks being important and accumulations being important. And you recognize whether it's captured in stocks and flows or captured in state charts or captured in variables, um, it's kind of potato potato. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's different ways of describing the system that is still amenable to this powerful um, sort of perspective and philosophy. That's my own, my own take on it. Um, Michael, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, great question. Um, so, yes, we have. Yeah, for some of our work with, um, I, I'd say our our like our chronic wasting disease work with. Um, this is a, a veterinary infectious disease. Um, uh, again, that 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 issue with deposition of prions and so on. Um, remember that model we showed, like the spatial patterning, the prions are deposited at the water margin in areas where there's large amounts of um, of, of of browse for the deer to to choose or or, or grazing there, depending on the the survey. Um, those. Uh, like the fact that we went through an agent-based modeling episode for that and, and sort of you know, sharpened our thinking, that then helped inform some system dynamics modeling that, that captured some of the same phenomena in a, in a far more artful way than the first time. And, and I'm a big believer in this multi-model approach. Yes. Uh, we, oh yeah, the question was, um, has, so, so uh, Michael noted that uh, University of Michigan uh, professor and head of the Laboratory for Complex Systems there, Scott Page, an esteemed colleague, someone I enormously respect and, and uh, whose work I follow with great interest and whose thoughts I follow with great interest. Scott is at University of Michigan and, and he, um, he talks about um, kind of multi-model and maybe multi-method approaches and you know, getting insights from multiple perspectives. And this is something I've been working to practice since around 2000, building agent-based models for tobacco use, building system dynamics models, and trying to use them to sort of sharpen our thinking collectively as a portfolio and, and learning from each other. Because each model has its limitations, each model has its blind spots, each model has its areas of strength and areas where it can be readily applied. And uh, Michael had asked, are there times where that learning catalyzed, you know, from one model catalyzed investments in another model, changes from another model, inclusion of a new feedback in another model or otherwise altered model structure, right? There were, I, I, you know, off the top of my head, I can remember um, that as an example. I, I think our TB work with the provincial TB program also uh, fell into that category um, as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, so system dynamics um, uh, is is a really powerful mechanism, uh, a really powerful perspective and, and methodology. Um, 
discrete event modeling is more is is somewhat more specialized. I, I think I think this is a, a really a fair thing to say. I'm, I'm going to say it's more specialized than either of the other two, and and it's more specialized. It excels at what it does to the area on which it focuses. It's just enormously expressive. For other areas, you can twist it. It's computationally universal. You can twist it to, des to describe other areas. Anything you can implement in one of these techniques, you can implement the other. You'll just be doing bizarre contortions and engage. I mean, it will make, you know, it, 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 it will be horrendous. Um, it, would, it would be professional malpractice. Um, so, so discrete event modeling focuses on, on structured workflows that are capacity limited. Now that's a mouthful. What I mean by that is we're dealing with resource limited flow through workflows. Um, by workflow, I mean it's a set of processes within a, a certain sort of defined uh, sequence, not necessarily linear, so branching, looping, et cetera. But those flowing in, which are called entities, in any logic, I just call them eight because they're really one and the same. Um, they flow through and they are operated upon by process. Um, and uh, they're critically, their ability to flow down this workflow is limited by availability of resources. So for example, if they need a CAT scan, they have to wait for the CAT scan machine to be available. If they need to be transported, you know, to a certain area of the hospital and they've broken their leg, they need to wait for a bed to push them, what have you. Um, maybe a, a physician is needed when doing a history of physical and, and diagnosis uh, appointment. Maybe a nurse is needed for certain types of, you know, hitching them up to a to a EKG or what have you. Um, or maybe a laboratory technician. In short, how they progress through these systems depends on resource availability. Um, and this type of modeling, this exquisite in its ability to describe these processes, you can declaratively characterize this depends on these resources. This you know, progress through here depends on these. You need a nurse and a bed for this one. You need a procedure room and a physician and a you know, in a, in a laboratory technician for this other one, what have you. Um, and uh, it's this capacity to identify um, throughput challenges, uh, issues having to do with how quickly people get seen, um, how soon they'll emerge, how many people can be seen per day, some aspects of quality of service, uh, as well as quality of care delivered with care, I mean, with, with, with effort, you can capture that. Um, but more to the fact, you can, or more to the point, you can ask what if questions about level of resources. You could say, suppose we added two more emergency room physicians. How would that help? Affect, how would that, to what degree would that help how long people have to spend waiting in the emergency room? And you may find it makes a big difference um, during peak times and not much other. Maybe it makes a big difference all the time. Maybe it makes almost no difference because the constraint is actually predominantly one of bed, for example. You can have all the physicians you want standing around, but they can't admit anyone because the beds are full. Um, so modeling of this sort helps us ask these resource and questions, also help resource coordination. You know, you could say, suppose for every physician who comes in, um, we have a nurse accompany them. Um, or the placement of resources. Where do you put the, the, the gurneys? Where do you put the beds? Where do you put naloxone kits to be able to respond quickly in the case of an overdose? Um, and, and, and it gets into issues of facility layout. Um, it's comparatively low reliance on computational skills. There's not as much programming involved as you would have seen already. There's, there's little bits in any logic you could pursue this, and, and if anyone's interested, since you're probably new to this, you can go to help example models here in any logic. And if you scroll down, there's something called the trauma center. So what did I do? I called up any logic. I went to help, 
and I said example models. And you go down here and, um, uh, and oh, oh, okay, um, trauma center, there it is. Um, okay, and the trauma center is going to be, it's, it's depicted here. It's basically depicting a, a center, I think it's a tertiary center for trauma treatment uh, based, on, based on the US. And, um, and you can find if you go and explore this thing, and, I, and we don't have time to do that in detail, but if you go, um, you'll, you'll find that there's different types of agents circulating. There's patients to be sure, but there's physicians, assistants, nurses, doctors, registrar, specialist, technicians, et cetera. And if you scroll down, you'll actually find this sort of structured workflow of which I spoke. And you'll find that there's a set of kind of uh, operators or the set of, 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 of possible choices. Some are kind of waiting for a nurse. They're waiting for a triage nurse, for example, in order to, to be triaged. And then after that, they go to the waiting room. And then they, then they need a registrar to, to let them in get their health information associated with them, I guess, and they have to go through registration. But if someone enters via ambulance, they may be fast-tracked um, to the ED side uh, at first, and they, they're assigned a nurse in an ED room, et cetera. But all this reflects you know, a need for resources. And by stating that we need a resource, um, we know that, okay, we, we have to have resources available. And if you go look at this model in more detail, what you'll find is that there are resources given, which basically represent um, the, um, the resources that are needed to undertake um, uh, to, to treat people and so on. And I'd have to go find exactly where they were here. I, I should be able to tell you. But there's resource pools, which basically say there's so-and-so many nurses and there's so-and-so many positions, so-and-so many rooms. Um, the rooms are actually sketched out in this map and you can see movement paths. So if you run a model like this, um, and we'll do that here, uh, you will find that um, people, these entities are flowing in, they are circulating, they are being operated upon by these processes. Here we go. So here are you know, physicians, and I think these are nurses there, and, and um, there may be technicians in the x-ray area. And you'll notice people coming in and they kind of move around and they, they undergo, here's someone coming in from an ambulance, I think, and they're put in a procedure room and someone goes and sees them. And we could view this in 2D alternatively and you'd see them moving around through this facility. Um, this is all governed by those processes. It's all governed by availability of resources, et cetera. And you'll notice that there's reports out of quantities of interest, such as how many people right now are in the emergency department, how many have, have uh, engaged in walk-in entry, et cetera. Um, and if you wanted to go down and, and see the process itself, you could see how many people were routed sort of through different levels of, of this process. Um, and uh, Statistics would give you sort of a high level summary of utilization or of waiting times or number of people being seen, the length of stay. This is this sort of modeling is extremely popular in healthcare service delivery. So um, delivery of, of healthcare services. So um, uh, a large important area of, of, of health sciences focused on, um, on ensuring quality, timely care, and broadly the, the triple or quadruple aim. Um, this is severity distribution of patients. Now, this is an individual level tradition. Like agent-based modeling, this depicts individuals um, at an individual, uh, at a, at a fine grained level. Um, but it does so in a way that is quite focused on um, the needs to, to assess flow through, through these processes. Okay, I'm going to comment um, on uh, contrasting benefits between these methods, but I, I think what we'll do is take a break now, because I think we could all use one, and we'll reconvene in 10 minutes and get started again. Um, yeah. Okay, great. So see you in 10.
I'll, I think I'll stop this recording and